Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to Neil Before Pod interviews. I'm your host Craig and recently I had the pleasure of talking to actor John Billingsley, most famously known as Dr. Phlox on Star Trek Enterprise. Our discussion covers being part of the Star Trek family, his experience of being a character actor and the charity he supports. And the charities he supports. Sit back, relax and enjoy. I am delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Dr. Phlox himself, John Billingsley. Hello, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. It really is. It's been, well, when was Enterprise on? 2005? It finished. 1700s, I think. Uh, there was it <laughs> on, as I recall, the pre-Renaissance years. It seems like another lifetime. 2001 to 2004. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, we premiered right after 9-11. Very strange. Yeah, less said about that, the better, I suppose. <laughs> Well, I remember this was odd because shortly after, not terribly long after 9-11, we were in production and I drove up to the lot and there were a group of people picketing outside the front of the lot. And I thought, oh my gosh, what has Paramount done to excite people? It must have something to do with 9-11, terrorism, yada, yada, yada. And I got closer in and it turns out it was a group of people saying, we hate the Enterprise theme song. We hate the Enterprise <laughs> theme song. I had mixed feelings. I thought... That seems rather small ball, given the nature of what's going on in the world. And two, Star Trek fans are intense. They are. Yeah, it's, it's an intense fandom. Although, yeah. is there a fandom that isn't really intense? I don't think there is. Uh, the Dr. Kildare fandom, I, I don't think is. they're also well over 100 <laughs> years old, but uh, I don't think they're probably too intense. My little Marge, <laughs> I don't think, had a huge fan base. Yeah. So let's start by just going right back to the beginning. How is it you got your start in your career of acting that then launched into... A million things on IMDb. When I was a kid, I'm not sure I'd call this a career starter, but it was certainly a, an interest starter. It piqued my interest. We'd moved up from the South, the Deep South. I was lived in Louisiana and Alabama. And I taught like this, and I had a lisp. And the Northern children were determined to beat both of those things out of me. So I was a class pariah, and I, I thought, God, I hate this. And they had mandatory school auditions for A Christmas Carol. Everybody had to read. I liked to read, so I was the only one who could lift the words off the page with any degree of passion, and I got cast as Scrooge. And so for one brief shining moment of glory, I actually went from being the class jerk to the class hero. And it consequently fed a great love of acting. Purely vanity. I didn't realize that it was also actually a wonderful practice in its own right. The initial appeal was purely, ooh, look at all the fifth grade girls who are actually interested in me now. <laughs> Soon as the play was over, I went right back to being the class pariah again, I should add. It was like shoots and ladders. And then my parents very generously, they appreciated that I had an interest in this. They made sure that I was able to study with some people who were teaching in and around the New York area, which is where we were living at the time. And then I kind of fell in love with it because I love the work. I love the process. I love engaging with the life of a fictional character, trying to figure out what makes him tick. I love great writing. I was pretty sure I was going to make my life as an actor right out of the gate after that. And then my professional start when I got out of college, you know, you think you're going to be a leading man, you're going to play Hamlet, you're going to play yada, yada, yada. I went to Seattle, Washington, in part because I was looking for a vibrant theater city where it wouldn't be too expensive to live. And I was cast as a retarded boy with cerebral palsy. I thought, oh, my career is going to take a slightly different direction than the <laughs> one perhaps I anticipated. Well, you know what they say, there's no small parts, only small actors. Well, you find out how the world sees you. <laughs> uh, apparently people see me as a child molester, a lunatic, a space alien, a brainiac, <laughs> variations on the theme of oddball. I'm never the senator. I'm never the guy that everybody jumps to attention when he walks into the room. I'm usually the guy who's hitting the back of the head with a spitball. And you, you said you love to read for listeners. He is uh, surrounded by books. It looks like if there's a mild earthquake, he'll be crushed. I will be crushed like the Collier brothers. You know who the Collier brothers are? Uh, no, I don't actually. They were two gentlemen, two brothers in the 1950s who lived in a dilapidated old warehouse, war veterans. One of them was disabled, sat in a corner in his wheelchair. The other one went and foraged. And in this warehouse, it was floor to ceiling magazines and books. The guy, the forager, came back, knocked into a pile of books, was buried alive, and the guy oh, in the God. wheelchair starved to death. Sad story. I shouldn't be <laughs> laughing, but it happened many years ago. But it was the birth of the concept of hoarders. Hmm. Nobody really quite had grappled with, wow, so that's how they live? Holy shit. And it became quite a story, quite an issue for a long time. They made a novel of it. E.L. Doctorow, who wrote Ragtime, wrote a novel called Homer and Langley about those two gentlemen. Anyway, this is how I'm going to die. I'll be buried alive in books. 
<laughs> I'm a bit like that with DVDs and Blu-rays. I'm a big physical media guy because I'm always frightened a streaming service is just going to take it off me at some point. Yeah, and when you're surrounded by the objects, you're more likely to, because I'm surrounded by books, I read a lot. If I didn't have books in the house, I wouldn't read as much. I wanted to live in a library when I was a kid. I used to cut school, go to the library, call my mother, who would pretend to be upset, but who secretly loved the opportunity to come herself and spend the day in the library with me. And now you practically do, by the looks of things, live in a library. I do. This is one room. Uh, all the rooms look like this. And uh, yes, it is. I have a very patient wife. <laughs> I, I frequently remind her that I could be a heroin addict, so it could be worse, honey. True. Very true. You have done a lot in your career. You said that you seem to fall into similar sorts of roles. You listed a few things that you tend to always play. Is there anything particular you enjoy playing more than anything else? Or is it just whatever's paying the bills you're happy to have a go at? Yeah, it has more to do with the quality of the writing overall, less with the type of part and more with whether or not it's richly and imaginatively conceived script and whether there's something juicy and multidimensional about it for you to play. And where I am in my career now, I mean, I'm in my 60s, you kind of begin to age out of certain categories. It can be tricky. There's always ageism in Hollywood. There's not as much work. So I kind of consider myself quasi demi semi retired. I'm happy to work when it comes up, but I spend a great portion of my life doing volunteer work and friend and fundraising for various charitable organizations. I love to read. I love to travel. I sort of long ago stopped doing stage work. Sometimes I miss it, but it's extremely physically taxing and I don't tend to think that I really quite have the stamina for it anymore. And you have done a couple of hit shows and things. Is that something that helped facilitate your moving into charity stuff in terms of giving you the time and opportunity to do that? I don't know that I was ever on any hits, but I've worked consistently for a long time. And my wife is an actress and she's worked consistently. And, you know, so much of this racket is just one foot in front of the next day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Some days you get lucky and you're in a series and it lasts for a while. And then after that, you're guest starring. You get a, a movie that pays a little more. You get a movie that pays a little less. As much as anything, it's just relentlessly showing up. <laughs> <laughs> being available to audition all the time, making an effort to make sure those auditions really represent. And it was really rewarding, really arduous, demanding work that we both loved for a number of years. I think when we got to the point where we felt like we didn't have kids, where we thought, you know, we don't have to work. I don't care about being like stupid rich. I just wanted to be comfortable and not have to worry. And we're there. So what else do we like? And we both have always been involved in charity work. And we just thought, well, what if we maybe spend a little more time doing that? So it's, it's good that the way that you've worked has helped you move on to do that and not worry about it. Because I know a lot of people would love to do more of that, but then it's commitments dragging them in other directions. Exactly, exactly. No, and I, and I took a good chunk of time to really devote to the organization I'm involved with now, which is the Hollywood Food Coalition, knowing that I was breathing rarefied air. You're right. It is hard to find people who can volunteer and put in as many hours as other people get paid for and never could and never will expect folks who are volunteering beside me who are also working, holding down a full-time job to be able to put in as much time or energy as, as I can. I'm in a lucky place that way. But on the other hand, that's why charitable efforts need retirees. They thrive on retirees because we do have that kind of time. Yeah. People that have let their full-time gigs go and just looking for something to fill the hours. Yeah. And God forbid, hey, somebody from on high called and said, John, we want you on a new series. Or, you know, hey, we've got this amazing project. It's not that I've held a gone fishing sign <laughs> out. It's just the reality of the business. There's just not as much. And you're competing at a certain point. When I was in my 30s, I was competing with a lot of people, many of whom were eventually going to drop out of the business because they didn't necessarily have the chops. Nowadays, if you're auditioning for a decent part and you're 63 years old, every single person you're auditioning against has got the chops. They stayed in this business. They're really good. You're elbowing with some pretty cool cats. Not a lot of people in their 60s who just think, I'll give acting a go for the first time right now. There are some, and God bless them, and every now and again, Wilford Brimley, I think, started late. It happens. It's not impossible. But yeah, when you think of all the work you have to do, not just can you do it, but to find representation. And anybody who's worth anything as an agent or a manager is going to say, okay, show me your reel. Show me what you've done. So if you're starting late and you say, I don't have a reel, I haven't done anything, yeah, it's going to be hard to crack that door. 
Yeah. On to some of the work that you've done then. The first thing I'm going to ask about is the time you played yourself. You were in an episode of Roswell playing yourself doing a fake Enterprise audition. What was that like? Did you take the opportunity to play an exaggerated version of yourself? I was played a, a version of myself who was an asshole. <laughs> kind of like, I can't believe I have to be here. And you know, that guy's not any good. Of course, in real life, you never actually audition. You know, you don't go in as a cast member on a show to audition people, but that's a dramatic license. What I will say is I think that was the first year of Enterprise, and I think they sort of started asking people in the cast if they would like to do this. And I think I was the last person left standing. <laughs> Scott said no, Connor said no, and Dominic said no, and I said no, and I said no, and I said maybe the dog will do it. With Porthos, no, no, the dog said no. <laughs> Billingsley, it'll have to be Billingsley. Yeah, well, I heard the dog had its own trailer, so that's not surprising. Two dogs, they were sisters. Dogs and children, as W.C. Field said. It's not so much the upstaging as it is, it's just dog can't hit its marks, and the dog has to be rewarded with a cheese ball after it does anything right. Would that we actors would get rewarded with cheese balls every time. <laughs> that's correctly. So it was constantly, you know, like, oh, my God, that dog is eating more cheese, getting gassier by the minute. This is a long day. <laughs> Scott had to do most of the dog work. I didn't have to deal with it. I just had to deal with Jolene. She was gassy, too, but that was different. That's a different story. You had a fair bit of dog work. You were always getting Orthos pammed on at you when Archer wasn't around. The dog was dying one time, but because he was dying, we didn't have to have a real dog. We had a stuffed dog. <laughs> And then there was one time when we're all in suspended animation, except for me and the dog. So I had some dog time in that episode too. We'll get on to more Enterprise stuff in a bit. But in terms of that, playing yourself, you were sort of playing yourself, playing flocks, but in an audition scenario, that must have been quite weird to play you as a character, then playing your character. Yeah, you know, it's funny. That was so long ago and it was just a tiny little scene and I was in and out in an hour and a half. So I don't really remember the scene. What I do remember is that's the first time I met Jonathan Frakes. I've just come to, I'm madly in love with him. We have something in common in that we both lost loved ones to pancreatic cancer, his brother and my mother. So we are on a team of people track against pancreatic cancer. We raise money for an organization called PANCAN, which is a Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. They do a walk every year called Purple Stride. So Jonathan and I have gotten to be quite close. We work with Kitty Swank, Armin Shimmerman, and uh, recently Manny Cotto's brother, Juan Carlos Cotto. Manny was one of our showrunners. So uh, that was the first time I met him, and I just thought, you're charming. <laughs> and then we cross paths at various conventions and what have you, and I just can't say enough good things about him. He's such a mensch. Yeah, he was a producer on that show. Yep. It was either the Delta Flyers or Shuttlepod that I heard you on talking about the pancreatic cancer initiative. Probably Delta Flyers. They had us on recently and uh, Shuttlepod, we hope we can appear on. A lot of my work, in all honesty, and one of the reasons I asked if I might appear on your show is because I have a great interest in encouraging the entire community of actors and directors and writers and designers and fans and podcasters to support each other's work on the charitable front to help spread awareness and recognition. We are ourselves starting a podcast called Trektivism, which is designed to tell stories, notably what the fans are doing to do good work in their community so we can keep alive what I think is the Star Trek ethos and the Star Trek spirit. It is communitarian, as my pal says. Oh, what is his phrase? I call it tractivism. He calls it Federation of Changemakers. I like that. I like that too. Although he was outvoted, we're calling it tractivism. <laughs> but the spirit of this wonderful franchise down all these years, to me, is very much rooted in a progressive understanding of it does take a village. And it does take all of us working together to build something that we believe has tremendous value for the future. And I cherish that. My years in Star Trek have been very dear to me because that reveals itself to me every day in the relationships I've, I've had the luxury of making. Yeah, it seems like very few actors let go of Star Trek and just forget about it. It, it seems like they live it for the rest of their lives once they've been in it in any significant capacity. Yeah. And my wife said to me early on, she said, well, this is the perfect job for you because you're the kind of guy who always looks around at a bar to see if somebody's going to buy you a beer. And now you can say, <laughs> back when I was on Star Trek and somebody <laughs> will buy you a beer. That is sadly true. <laughs> How she came to know me so well so quickly is a mystery to me. Yeah. Well, we're all looking for people to buy us a beer, I suppose. I know. When I was young and I Spent umpteen years as a stage actor where you make like five bucks a year. I was always broke. One of the reasons <laughs> I'm interested in working on anti-poverty initiatives in, in that field. I was always, anytime you walk in the bar, you got two thoughts. It's like, do I owe anybody money? If so, I better get out fast. <laughs> and who might buy me a beer? 
I sound like a horrible alcoholic. I'm talking to a Scotsman, you understand. Yeah, yeah. Beer is a significant social thing for us, so no judgment here. I was more of a Manhattan drinker, but the same basic fundamental theory applies. And it seems like it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy then. Someone buys you a beer and then you owe them money the next time you're in. That's the problem. So you always look for those people who don't keep score. <laughs> there are people who are going to buy you a beer out of the kindness of their heart, and there are people going to buy you a beer, but you're damn well going to buy them two beers the next time you see them. <laughs> you had to learn how to avoid those people until time passed, and then they forgot. <laughs> I perhaps exaggerate just a touch, but <laughs> similar to the Roswell thing, something that you were in during Enterprise's run was Angel, where you played a werewolf expert. Was that kind of a cross promotional? You're an Enterprise being this other show? No, what what was great about those guys, and they were very sweet to me, is, you know, I was number seven on the call sheet, and I certainly had episodes that involved me, but there were a fair number of episodes. I mean, they wanted all the young people to run around in their underpants, and nobody wants me to run around in my underpants. So I had time off, and uh, Rick and Brannon were, particularly in the first couple of years, very gracious about letting me look for other work. I would try and get the first draft, usually the hair guy, the hair department, we weren't supposed to see the first draft because the writers were always afraid, the producers were always afraid the actors would call them and bitch like, hey, how come <laughs> I'm not in? I don't like what I never bitched. It was like if I wasn't in it, I thought, oh, OK, I have to get paid anyway. Now I can go find other work on top of this. I was much more ambitious then. <laughs> so if I got a look at the first draft, it looked like I wasn't going to be heavily in it. I would tell my agents, OK, put me out. Let me see if I can get something. So I auditioned for Angel and got Angel and I auditioned for this and got that and yada, yada, yada. It's rare these days for an actor who is on a show to have the luxury of being able to do other things. They were very nice to me. Angel was also right next door to us, which was interesting on the Paramount lot. We did not have fancy catered meals at lunch. We basically were left to our own devices. Those of us like me who were the makeup, I got to order from the commissary. But everybody else had to go and fend for themselves. People brought a bag lunch. Angel, on the other hand, it was like, oh, my God, this elaborate, lavish lunch. It's like lobsters and steaks. So when I was working next door at Angel, I would always load up the plate with steak and lobster, and I'd go next door and eat it. In front of it. <laughs> this angel food is real. I'm sorry you can't have any because that's not allowed. I was a mean, mean person back then. When it's about having lunch, it's all fine. I used to have a little song I'd sing specifically for Dominic. I would search him out. I would try and find him because, as I said, I was not there all the time. But Dominic, he always had to be on the bridge, you know. Everybody was called up to the bridge. The aliens coming. I didn't have to go to the bridge. So I had a little song I used to sing called Day Off, <laughs> Day Off. Six days off and the check still come. Character actor in the sun. Six days off and the check still come. I would sing that for Dominic. He'd get fairly furious at me. I could never get there the second verse without him yelling at me. I've met Dominic. It seems like it wouldn't take much to wind him up. It doesn't take anything at all to wind him up. And consequently, that's the kind of guy that you want to wind up all the time. Somebody did a bootleg recording of him in the spacesuit. Those spacesuits were enormously uncomfortable. And he had a episode in which uh, he had to be in the spacesuit for a whole day and there was a director who was taking a particular we had some directors who were very meticulous was like i think i got that but let me let me put the camera over here okay and then I, i'm gonna take a put the camera over here i'm gonna see this might be an interesting shot if i at one point dominic was like oh i'm in a fucking spacesuit what you got i'm in a goddamn spacesuit now i can wait to you without a fucking spacesuit <laughs> The sound recorded that, so anytime a guest star would come on and the guest star had scenes with Dominic, I said, you might want to listen to the Dominic tape here. Come here, come here, come here. I'd play the Dominic bootleg tape. So just, <laughs> Dominic's an interesting. I didn't really do that. I would never want to scare a guest star that way. I'd do it after the guest star work is out. After they'd finished, yeah. Dominic's a very dear friend of mine, and I, I like nothing more than to make fun of him. And I'm sure somewhere out in the universe right now, today, he's making fun of me just as much. Yeah, that's how friendship works. Dominic introduced me one time at a party. He said, I'd like to meet my friend John. He's on my show. <laughs> Dominic Keating Variety Hour? Is that what they call it now? Thanks. What was working on Angel Like? That was another one of my favorite shows back in the day. One of those sadly cancelled before its time shows when you're a guest you may only be there for a few days sometimes you'll be there for seven days but in that instance i want to say i was only there for three days and it's really hard to get the vibe of a show in such a short amount of time sometimes you do i mean sometimes you can just tell right away that everybody is deeply affectionate it's fun everybody loves each other sometimes you feel like there's a strange kind of maybe tension on the set and you're not quite entirely sure where it comes from in that particular instance, David Boreanaz had had a, 
I think, knee surgery. He was in pain. And so there was a little bit of a kind of a pall on the set that week because he was kind of suffering. And, you know, when number one is in a grumpy mood, the whole set is a little like, a well, be careful. So my memory of that set was it wasn't as, as giddily convivial as I suspected might otherwise have been at, at, at other times. Next time I watch that episode, I'll see if he's sitting down in more of his scenes than not. Yeah, he had to throw me across the table at one point in time. And I, I remember he was like, why I go, let's not do this again. I was like, why can't we get it in one? <laughs> like, not my fault. I'm taking the fall, baby. Not, not my problem. <laughs> Actors are funny that way. I had X-Files and I had to pull Jillian Anderson up and stick a needle in her neck. And she's a tiny little thing. There's not a lot of room to maneuver between her breasts and (laughs) her other parts. So it was like, it's a very small slice of territory I have to work with when I grab any sister. She was, I think, feeling like I was taking advantage. It's like, I'm not. I just... I'm just trying to get it. I just, yeah, it's really, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to touch you. I'm just trying to stick a hypodermic needle into your neck. (laughs) There's another one episode part that I remember that you did, Nip Tuck, when you played a man with body integrity disorder. I haven't seen the episode in many years, but it really stuck with me because it was one of those, oh, I had no idea how this sort of thing worked. It seemed to be a really sensitive portrayal of that condition. Yeah, and it is in the same family of, I won't call them disorders because I don't think it's a disorder. It is in the same family of conditions, let's call it a condition for for lack of work, as the same condition that some people wanted to change their gender. There are people, not a ton of them, who are born feeling that they have an extraneous limb, that they are not right. They are not in possession of the body they feel that they should have. There are only about 150 cases in the world at any given point in time, but some of the people who have that condition went to extraordinary lengths to sever an arm or sever a leg. And I believe in Scotland, in fact, there was a law passed that forced doctors to turn down any patient who came in and asked for a surgery, an amputation that was not medically necessary. I mean, obviously, I don't want to make a crass comparison between people who want to have gender surgery. But even at the time, my thought was the ultimate autonomy is the autonomy you have over your body. It is what I think this show eventually came to that point of view is as much as we may, from our perspective, view the decision to do something that we might think is untoward, it's none of our goddamn business. If the other person is not hurting another person, they have a right to do what they wish with their body. It's such an odd lens to tell that story through. But in the end, I thought it was a progressive story. Nip Tuck was always like that in terms of finding all these little fringe elements to play with. Yeah, I had never heard of that particular condition before, but it was really interesting to learn about it. I'm guessing you did a lot of research before playing the role, yeah? Sometimes you have time and sometimes you don't. And that's really the challenge. I mean, I've played blind people or deaf people or disabled people, and you yearn to have the time to actually do justice to what that is really like. And particularly on television, even in the movies, you don't always get that time if you're a supporting character especially in this particular instance the other thing that i remember about that episode is they arranged to have the way they reveal when i eventually drop my trousers and it's like oh he's tied his leg behind him to make it seem as if he only has one leg well i had to actually have my leg tied behind me for the better part of a number of shooting days and that was pretty fucking miserable (laughs) I, i remember that being one of those shows where it's like i'm really glad this is almost over mentioned nip tuck in years you get a blue ribbon for that yeah well i used to watch the show i don't think i ever finished it but i watched it up until a certain point and i remember that episode really stood out to me when i first saw it as well and ryan murphy has never cast me again so there you go (laughs) easy come easy go it was a weird one because it was sort of half this sensitive here's how this thing is and then the other half is threatening lives foolish (laughs) yeah well that's his thing i mean ryan murphy's american horror story it's there's some very interesting social observation that's wrapped in a great ball of gru and gore (laughs) yeah so there you go there's a an obscure thing that you might not get asked about very much i love it i know this is my favorite thing when people reach into the vault and pull out some remember when you were in mrs farnsworth's dilemma well i haven't seen that but yeah i made that up there's no such thing (laughs) 
you've also done some voice acting as well. What's that like going into a booth to record as opposed to turning up to set to record? Tiny bit. And I never pursued it. I mean, there are people who have amazing voiceover careers and I just never wanted it badly because that actually doesn't in all candor interest me that much. I have tremendous admiration for people who are good at it and for people who read books on tape and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just want the full instrument. I need my ugly puss. I need to fling my arms around. And it's also just technically speaking, there are so many different ways you can pursue a career as an actor. You can have a voiceover career, a commercial career, a film career, a TV career, a stage career, musical comedies, yada, yada, yada. I kind of began to hone in on what I wanted to do, which was on-camera work, film and television. And I thought the amount of effort, time and energy you have to expend to become a truly successful voiceover actor, it's greater than I want to spend. I don't know. I'm having a nice run with this stuff. If somebody wants to offer me something, huzzah. But I don't want to spend my days going in and auditioning in the booth or making the voice recordings at home. I, I just didn't want to do it. Well, I've spoken to a lot of voice actors on various projects, and it's interesting to find out about how the discipline of that sort of acting works. Yeah, I couldn't really tell you because I've never done enough to speak very eloquently to it. The bottom line is that you've got a text that you want to bring to life. I'm sure that there is a lot of very specific and rarefied technique, but, you know, I did a lot of classical stuff on stage. I certainly feel like I could be an effective voice actor. Also, so much of it, I stopped long ago doing commercials. I don't want to do commercials. I don't mean to weigh in on it. I just don't want to do them. And so many people who make their living in true voiceover artists do a lot of commercials. And then there are a lot of cartoon pilots. And a lot of those pilots, kids shows that aren't that good. What you see emerge, cartoons in the movies or The Simpsons, etc., is the tip of 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 the iceberg of the stuff that gets made. And most of it doesn't interest me. There's no shame in saying that this avenue isn't for me. That's just your decision. That and professional bowling. <laughs> Fair enough. Another show I love that you're on, an episode of Lucifer. I love that show because it was just so off the wall and insane. And Seriously. With the wonderful, the gentleman who played Lucifer, who I didn't get to know very well. Tom Ellis. Yeah. And the other gentleman who was the true guest star in that particular episode, who is the lawyer on Better Call Saul. Who is that? Did you see Better Call Saul? I haven't seen it yet. No, I never sat down to watch it. I did watch Breaking Bad, but not Better Call Saul. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, he's a wonderful, wonderful actor. I'm embarrassed that I'm spacing on his name because he's a great guy. TV show years and years ago and such a lovely man I've got great uh, affection for him that was what I remember about that show was I got to catch up with him it's uh, funny this business because so much of what is wonderfully random is you get cast as a guest star and you show up on the set it's like hey Charlie <laughs> I haven't seen you in 20 years we were on that dumb movie together ah oh Bill <laughs> I love that about this industry people that were grips on a TV show you did 30 years ago, like, remember me? I dropped a anvil on your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Must have felt like coming home doing the Orville then, because that has a lot of former Star Trek people working on it. Although I didn't have that much interaction with those people on that particular shoot. We weren't on the bridge. But Bob Carter, of course, is a dear friend. And Molly Hagen, who played his wife, is an old friend of mine. And in fact, <laughs> on the set that week, I inveigled her into joining the board of the Hollywood Food Coalition. <laughs> so yeah, that was definitely a little bit of old home week. Bob is a dear friend of mine who I adore. Yeah, you were the evil doctor in that episode. I was evil. I'm frequently evil. Dr. Flock is very unusual for me. I'm more evil than good. And you even got to play Evil Flocks at one point, so it all came to a circle. I did, yeah. I felt the Evil Flocks had one similarity to non-Evil Flocks. They both took a lot of joy in life. <laughs> evil Flocks took joy as a vivisectionist. Regular Flocks took joy as a healer, but still joy. The wellspring was still joy. <laughs> and you spoke earlier about doing Enterprise, where it was actors running around their underwear, but you also did True Blood, which is essentially what that show is as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the second season, I was the coroner, and the gag in the second season, was there was a, a sorceress who gets us all under a spell, and she releases our erotic energies, which she feeds on. So the entire season, one, I signed a nudity waiver. I thought, oh, nudity waiver, sure, okay, fine. <laughs> I didn't realize it meant you will not wear clothes for the entire season. You will run around naked in the cold every night, freezing your tuckus off. It was miserable. Miserable. There's a woman... An extra. I did not know this. If you're an extra and you're naked on a TV show, they pay you by the breast. So if you show two breasts, it's a hundred bucks. And if you show one breast, it's fifty bucks. So this woman, I was supposed to be dirty dancing with her, and she kept trying to show two breasts. And the first AD, second AD was like, No, 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 just one breast. Cover that up. <laughs> and she's like, 
Cover it up. But then she'd, you know, reveal the second. No, no, cover that up. Cover that up. She kept stopping the shot. It's like, I'll give you 50 fucking bucks. Would you <laughs> let us get on with the shot? Yeah. It was cold. No wonder people feel undervalued in, in Hollywood if that's the kind of thing you're getting paid for. I know. If it's 50 bucks a tip. I'd get home and my wife would say, what'd you do today? It's like, well, I took somebody from behind. I rubbed chocolate cake on a guy. I rubbed chocolate cake on another guy. And I rubbed chocolate cake on a lady. I licked the chocolate cake. It was a bad day. It was a long day. My wife was like having none of that. It was like, uh-huh. You wait. You wait. One of these days, you're going to get an offer to do something where you have to run around naked. And you'll see that it's no fun at all. And then she did. She got a horror movie and she had to run around naked and I made her take the job. She's <laughs> not going to do this. And I said, oh, no, you're doing it. You're doing it. Did you have any idea what you were getting in for when you got True Blood? Did you know the show beforehand or was it all a complete surprise? I didn't know anything about it. I had a great admiration for Alan Ball. I loved Six Feet Under. Did you ever watch Six Feet Under? Some of it, yeah. Way back. It's, it's a show before True Blood, which I thought was great, set in a funeral parlor and the disaffected family. And every episode begins with somebody dying. And I played a guy who was so boring that his wife eventually clanks him with a frying pan and I, I die. We practiced that at home, but I wouldn't let my wife use an actual frying pan. <laughs> anyway, I loved his work. So I was thrilled to get cast in an Alan Ball series. My honest opinion of it is that what I thought was a show that was going to be kind of an interesting exploration of what it's like to mainstream when you've been in the shadows, which I thought was sort of about the gay rights movement, you know, pre-Stonewall. There was no way to be publicly gay. And then post the Stonewall, it's like, wait a second, it's possible to have my identity in the world. I thought that metaphor was really interesting. And then I thought the show became so in love with all the supernatural fairies and witches and werewolves and goblins and that it kind of lost some point and purpose, in my opinion. Not that, not that I volunteered that to Alan Ball. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't a show I watched too much of. I couldn't get into it. Frankly, what sometimes happens if you're recurring is you watch up until the point you stop recurring. <laughs> so <laughs> when they stop using me, I stopped watching. Then they brought me back in the fifth season. It was like, oh, fuck, I don't know what's going on anymore. I stopped watching years ago. All right, well, whatever. Just read the scripts and hope for the best. Yeah, they killed me. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, so on to Enterprise then. I'm sure you've been asked a lot of these questions before. I make up different answers every time, so that's how it's interesting. There'll be no canon of your career in Enterprise, that'll be the way it is. I've told my origin story in a thousand different ways. What the hell? So your origin story then, how did you come to be on the show? And were you into Star Trek before you were on the show? Not particularly. I mean, I'd watched the show as a kid. I was six years old when the original series premiered in 1966. Don't have deep memories of it, but I watched it in reruns when I lived in the New York area on Channel 11. I'd come home from school, I'd watch Star Trek, The Little Rascals, Abbott and Costello. I'd pretend I was doing my homework. So I, I had a passing familiarity, but I did not watch any of Next Gen, Deep Space, or Voyager. I didn't watch a ton of TV for a long, long time because I was a theater actor and I was always working at night. So when I got Enterprise, I was definitely, who are the, what, for, what are these? The, I had a friend, Ferengi. Ferengi, okay, what are they like? He went through all the species, one by one by one by one. And he kind of gave me a crash course. So that, that helped. I definitely knew that my life was changing, and I appreciated the cultural significance of the franchise, even if I didn't understand all the arcana of the pre-existing iterations of Star Trek. But they called me in. Pilot season, you know, get called in for all sorts of things. Sometimes you get a full script. Sometimes you just get the sides, the scene you're auditioning with. In this instance, I just had the scene, and all it said was, you're an alien space doctor, come in with a slight alien accent. All right. I thought it was Scottish. I just I thought, ah, come inside. Oh, that's been done. Can't do that. So I tried various funny voices with the missus, and she was like, no, 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 don't do that. So finally, I came in with a voice that I more or less ended up with as Dr. Flox, which just had sort of a slight lilt. The only thing that I thought I, I could add to it was that perhaps I thought on his home planet, in moments of rapture and joy, he would squawk because perhaps they were more of an avian species. So I uh, I went in, and blah, 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 rah, 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 and I squawked. And much to my chagrin, I got the job. I'm thinking, oh, fuck, I'm going to be a bird. <laughs> what do I think about that? I'm going to be a bird for seven years, you know? I'm going to have to learn how to, I'm going to imitate, I'm going to watch birds, read about birds. I'm thinking, I'm like, what have I fucking done to myself? <laughs> Mind you, nobody ever said anything to me about the squawk or whether they wanted me to be a bird. And up until the day we started shooting, I was still like, oh. So I squawked. The first time I appeared on the set and we worked with the director and as soon as a squawk poured forth, the director said, quit fucking around, John. <laughs> how I knew I wasn't a bird. So they cast me in spite of the fact that I squawked 
in the middle of the audition. No one ever said anything to me. You know, I don't know. Brandon and Rick would play their cards very close to the vest, I learned. I love them both, but you could never quite get a straight answer out of any of them. Witness that. It's like, am I a bird in the show? I suppose that's a lesson. Whatever funny voice you do in the audition, you might be stuck with it for the better part of a decade. Absolutely. Well, that's exactly right. When you audition for something, if it's going to go to a series, you don't know. Like is not you haven't read the script. Back in the day, when I was younger and I had more auditions, you may be going out for five or six things that week. You're jamming. It's like, oh, okay, you're all right. Right, 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 okay. And you go in and you do something and they like it. And it's like, wait a second. Did I want to be doing this for years? Is this what I, I'm playing a shriveled up one-eyed guy who talks like this? I changed my mind. So yeah, yeah, you do have to, when you're at a, another echelon than I ever got to, and you can afford to be persnickety, of course, it's like, no, I'll pass. No, I'll pass. I'll, I'm going to hold out for it. I never had that luxury. So if they want me to squawk like a bird, I'll squawk like a bird. For seven years. Seven years. It turned out to be four years. I was the only one who wasn't really that unhappy when it ended. I loved everybody. It was fun. I liked the part. It was nice to make the dough, bought a house. But wearing a rubber head is a little tiresome. And the eyeballs were painful. So when we wrapped, I think everybody else was crying. And I was kind of going, yeah, that's pretty sad. How many hours of makeup was it for you? Two and a half. Two and a half. Two and, a half and then half an hour, 40 minutes to take it off. It's not like in Mission Impossible where you can just rip it off your face. It, it actually has to be unpeeled with that little remover and then the hot towels and then the da, 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 da. it's quite a process. At the end of the day, you want desperately to just do that. So on the days when you worked and in the episodes when you were used quite a bit, you take what was sometimes a 12-hour day, sometimes even a 14-hour day, and you tack an extra three and a half or four hours, including travel time on top of it, there were some days where it was like, motherfucker. On the other hand, I have a house. I know Michael Dorn always talks about how when he was on Next Gen, he was first in and last to leave. Yep. And he had to do ferocious manly things. I got to wear pajamas and just talk about endocrine systems. Well, at least you didn't have to wear skin tight uniforms, I suppose. No, I didn't. I didn't have a mouthful of choppers the way that Armin and the Ferengi had. <laughs> I mean, I got off pretty light. They realized as it went along, I think, by the time they got to our show, that, that they had to be mindful of how long it did take to put somebody in and take somebody out because they had something in Hollywood called sofa money, which is the turnaround. They don't give you enough hours between you going home and then coming in the next day. It's an extra thousand clams. So they don't like to pay what we call sofa money. A thousand bucks buys you a sofa. They go to great lengths to keep that from happening, which on some level means let's figure out how to make this rubber-headed alien a guy that can get into a rubber head in less than three hours, please. And they be judicious in what you shoot in a day, I guess, as well. Make sure you get the most out of it. Which is always a challenge. Always a challenge. Television as opposed to film, I'm sure you know. We film, you know, maybe you'll shoot sometimes two pages a day. Television, sometimes you'll shoot ten pages a day. Television is go, 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 go. If you can get it in one, you get it in one. I mean, you can ask for another take, but television is the art of moving quickly. And if you have a problem, solving it quickly. I think a lot of people who go into this medium particularly don't realize that as an actor your first obligation obviously first obligation is to give a good performance but your second obligation is don't hold up camera and scott our captain and generally speaking people who are good number ones one on the call sheet the star are people who really understand that how important it is to keep a crew feeling like the ship is moving if an actor who plays number one is perceived as being a guy who slows the ship down, it engenders a lot of ill will very quickly. Now, I've spoken to directors that have worked with Scott Bakula before, and they said that, yeah, he's always on, always on point, always sharp. Yeah, and very astute about the challenge of the scene and the challenge of the day and the challenge of getting the scene and how can you make it easier to shoot? And is there a way to turn this into a three shot or, or a one or or? Can we use the lighting from the previous setup? Do you have to relight? He's very hep to all of the intricacies that go into making your day faster. And he's also just a courteous gentleman. I mean, he understands and appreciates how important it is to remember people's birthdays and to make sure that you, you say hello and you greet every extra and every stand-in and every buddy who's a guest star new to the show. I've worked with a number of actors who really represent as number one. Mark Harmon is number one on NCIS. And then when you work with a number one that doesn't do that, 
to me, it's like I spend a good portion of my day trying to avoid the interaction because I see them not being the captain. It's like, you're not doing your job. Well, my only encounter with Scott Bakula was at a convention and I got a photograph with him and he took the time to say hello and that's what my name was, which I couldn't say for some other big name of Star Trek actors that I wouldn't name right here. Yeah. Although I will say it's really frustrating for me that part of going to the conventions where they're the line of people going through for photos, I really want to take time. And it's the photographer and the people who are running the convention who are always like, go, 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 go. It's really annoying. It's a weird thing to sign photos and ask people to give you money for it. That was of all the things that was, for me, the weirdest about just this business. That was weird. I was like, all right. But I thought, really, at the least, please, it's got to be a really nice, warm human interaction so somebody feels at least they had a pleasant experience. When convention organizers or the powers that be are making people feel like there's a whip being cracked, I really always stand up to that and say, I'm sorry. I will go through and I will apologize to the entire line. I'm going to be slower than these other guys, but when you get to me, we can at least chat for a second, okay? (laughs) I think most people understand the the photo thing has to move quite quickly, but at a minimum, if the person you're being photographed with says hello, that means something, whereas it doesn't always happen. I I know. And sometimes when you take the group photos, the variance between the one person who wants to say hello and the other person is like, come on, come on, come on. Take one picture with me and take one picture with this guy. I don't want to be in a picture with that guy. (laughs) Hey, nice. So with Phlox, what's your favorite thing about Phlox? What's something that you loved about the character and still love about the character. I love that character. I love the fact that he never lost his sense of humor, which I really appreciate. And it was a dry sense of humor. Even in the darkest of days in the third season. Yeah. My sense of him was that he'd lived a wonderful, fun life. He had grown kids. He was ready to have this amazing last act. And he didn't care if he died. It was like he had a philosophical detachment when it came to his mortality that I really liked. Doesn't mean that he didn't care about other people's lives or that he didn't, as a doctor, take his work seriously. It just meant that his own journey had led him to the point where he was prepared to effectively go on what he probably thought was a form of a suicide mission. I mean, the first human ship going out and, you know, it's like, I'll go. What the hell? These people have no idea what they're doing, but I'll give it a go. Yeah, exactly. They do, but they're interesting. They're interesting. I like being around them. They're amusing. He took great amusement in everything, which I really pray. I like the fact that he would just, like, eat anything. It's like, let me try that. Oh. I mean, if you went to an alien planet and if you didn't understand what any of the food was, your first reaction probably wouldn't be like, oh, let me try that. It'd be <laughs> like, what is that? Is it going to kill me? Is it going to kill me? Is it going to... Yeah. Dr. Flox was perfectly prepared to do and try pretty much anything. There are individual episodes and individual moments and individual interactions with actors that are very dear to me, but my overriding sense of getting to play him for four years was just that I thought his spirit and his life force and his philosophy was closer to mine than anybody I'd ever played. And I imagine as time went on, you got to bring a bit more of yourself into the character as well. You know, as opposed to Bob Picardo, who would spring out of the bushes to get Wilkin Brandon to write shit for him, like, make me an opera singer. How about I have an affair with Jerry Ryan? I never did that. I didn't have his balls. I was not somebody who, in any way, I won't say hectored, because I think Bob was very wonderful about doing that. I just never went to the writers or the creators and said, what about making? How about? What do you think? So whatever emerged, I just played. So whether they just had a good sense of me... I always have to give credit to the writers. They created the character. I just said the words. I think it was a good match, which is what casting is. You hope that when casting directors and producers cast, they recognize that that's the person that has the spirit we're looking for. Somehow, in that instance, I matched up. Was there anything that you didn't get to do as Flocks that you would have loved to do? I know you didn't ask the writers for anything, but is there something you'd have loved? I was sorry that Kelly Waymeyer passed away for many reasons. She played Ensign Cutler in season one, and she was a lovely actress and a lovely person. I just so enjoyed working with her and getting to know her. She died, shockingly, of an undiagnosed heart condition. Her boyfriend, who was also a friend, came home, found her dead on the sofa. She and I were developing a relationship. I don't know if it would have emerged into a full-blown relationship, but it was a relationship. And I rarely, if ever, get to have a romance on screen. So that was a loss. And it was in that first season. That was the only real romance that was in the offing. This was before Trip and Paul. So there was a little moment when I thought, I'm going to be the one who has a love affair? <laughs> that I regret. 
I was always interested in learning more about Denobula, about the culture, about the society. Sometimes I sort of thought, oh, I wouldn't have seen that coming, all right. But generally, I thought in episodes where you learn more about the people of Denobula, bring more of that on. And the other thing that always interested me, which I don't know where you would have gone with it, is that I came from a very different culture and I had a very different set of conceptions. When you put that in the world of the Vulcans versus the humans, it's conflict. When you put that in the realm of the Klingons and the humans, it's conflict. When you put it in the world of the Denobulans and the humans, it was more mentoring. I thought I was a teacher. I thought it was interesting to try and say... I appreciate where you're coming from, but can I offer you a different perspective? I would have been interested to see how his his recognition that maybe he had more to offer as a teacher might have blossomed and what that might have meant. Especially with Archer not willing to listen to Paul as much early on because the adversarial relationship between Vulcans and humans then has this seasoned alien that doesn't from his perspective, act smug around him. Yeah, and that's what I loved about him, is I didn't think he was smug about it. I didn't think he was arrogant. I didn't think he was like a know-it-all. I just think he's like, you know, where we come from, this is what we believe, and this is how it functions for us. And you might be interested in thinking about that perspective. And I didn't think he ever forced it. In those episodes where it was like, I'm sorry, but I cannot do what you're asking me to do, because... I am not a member of your military team. I'm assigned to you as a doctor from another place, and we don't do that shit. I like that. I would have been interested to see if more of his forcefulness about an ethos. For instance, in season three, there were things about season three that, to me, given the time we lived in, the climate of times, 9-11, and what that show was kind of trying to do, riffing on 9-11, you know, we've been attacked by bugs, and we're going to do anything to avenge ourselves. It's us or them. I was uncomfortable with aspects of the show that I, th- I thought were a little xenophobic in the third season. I would have been interested if Flox's pushback, they put the pushback more frequently into Paul, would have been interested in knowing more what Flox's pushback was to this. They're different, but there are still people we can understand that in some way. Yeah. Well, yeah, they set it up in a way that didn't give, I mean, it's not the Iraq war. The Iraq war was, this is what 24 did too, which is where, unfortunately, Manny Cotto has passed away and I love him and he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. And, and we had some arguments about it, but in my opinion, the nature of what we had to ask ourselves as a society post 9-11 is, is what Israel is having to ask itself right now. What the world is asking Israel is if the reaction to an atrocity is perceived eventually as worse than the atrocity itself, have you lost the political capital and the ability to represent yourself on the world stage as civilized? Have you become that which you were supposedly opposed to in the first place? That is the great moral dilemma for all civilizations. The Iraq war to me was a perfect example of what happened in America. We chose to invade Iraq for putatively good reasons, but much of it was ginned up in response to 9-11 based on false premises. It happened in England. We suffered because of that as a country, as a culture, as a world. Enterprise riffed on that, but it didn't create a storyline that allowed that question to really come to the forefront. It was random attack by people without any motivation whatsoever. We have no choice because the world is at stake. There's no question about it. No question about it. There should have been a question about it. Dramatically. The benefit of hindsight is, yeah, we could have dug more into this and and possibly science fiction can be digging more into it now as well. Yeah, and I think it does. I mean, I think great literature does that. Popular culture, it's it's trying to grab a big audience. So I give total props to Star Trek and to science fiction generally for doing some very heavy lifting when it comes to exploring these kinds of themes. And I think Star Trek has done historically really good job at representing progressive values. At the same time, to me, season three, because the commercial impulse to bow in the direction of, we got to get that audience back, let's give them something that is more like rah, rah, rally the flag boys post 9-11. I felt like, hmm, that's not how I see Star Trek function. Individual stories within that season, I thought were very strong because it did do one thing which was necessary. It amped up the stakes. And it created more of a pulse for the show, which I thought tended, particularly the second season, to be a little, a little drift in the second season. And then season four was back to fundamentals in a lot of ways. Yeah, and that's because Manny really was given the keys to the car. He was given the keys to the car in season three, but he was really given the keys to the car in season four because we still in season three thought we had a snowball's chance in hell of coming back for season four. Season four, that was it. Some of the actors deluded themselves into thinking it wasn't it, but that was it. We weren't going to go anywhere any longer so season four was like we'll do whatever the fuck you want 
You don't have to care about the ratings anymore. Just make the show you want to make. And Manny had a, a deep love of the original series. And so he made a lot of Valentine shows based on that, which I think a lot of fans really appreciated, you know, bringing Brent Spiner back and why the Klingons' heads look different. It was very clever, I thought, what he did. Some would argue questions that never needed to be answered with Klingon foreheads, but they did it. Doubt, doubtless, doubtless, doubtless. I felt that way about the Mirror Universe if it came to that. I sort of thought, this is clever because it calls back to some of the things from the original series, but I don't think the storytelling actually really pays off particularly. Yeah. But then the episode where we clone Trip, the episode that is sort of a, again, it looks at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from a sci-fi mirror. I can't remember the exact details of the story. But there were several episodes in that season that I thought were spot on for what Star Trek does at its best. Oh, definitely. They found a way to shift the lens, look at something that is relevant to us. Everybody was involved. The emotional stakes were high. It was dramatic and tense because we had a mission. We had to get on with it. We definitely had a lot fewer stinkers in season three and four than we did in seasons one and two. Yeah, pretty much every Star Trek fan will agree with you there when it comes to Enterprise. It's one and two, not the best. Three and four, way better. Yeah. And I've understood from what I've heard from other fans that that's true for Next Gen too. And I don't know if it was true for the series, but it takes a little while to find the footing. I didn't necessarily pin that as much on the cast as I did, I think, on the fact that Rick and Brandon were kind of rushed into production. They were asked to come up with a show as Voyager was ending, and they weren't given a year off. Their tongues were dragging. It was like, okay. So I think by the time we premiered, the original conceit was the first year would just be on Earth, and it was just going to be figuring out how to get that spacecraft up. And in that way, it was going to be more soap opery, maybe more realistic, maybe more grounded. The network said, no, 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 no. Star Trek is, you know, you're up and you're doing it. No way. So they scrapped a whole season of story come up with a new season you got three days so yeah they were up against it i think a lot and it was coming out at that time where you weren't going to get two years to find your feet really anymore but now in the modern tv landscape it's if you're not great in your first season then you're not carrying on even if you are great you sometimes don't carry on yeah well now streaming has changed that so i think back in the day yes miraculously we did get four years not seven but candidly, if it hadn't been a franchise show, and if it hadn't been on UPN, which didn't have anything else, we wouldn't have survived past the first year. We would have been canceled before 13 were out. 10 million, I think, watched the first episode, and then 2 million watched the second episode. That's the kiss of death. It's funny now that it's available on streaming and people have revisited it, and I think some people have a slightly less negative response to it. Some people maybe even like it. At the time, there was a lot of... I don't know how to describe this. Some of it was Star Trek fatigue. Some of it was people clamoring for new people at the helm, not another Rick and Brandon show. Some of it was, I don't want a prequel, keep going forward. Some of it was, if you're going to do a prequel, can you, actually more or less what I thought, can you go farther in the direction of making it scarier? There was an episode early on when the transporter was supposed to malfunction. Originally in the first draft, the guy comes back from a transporter visit to a planet and is like, his head is where his ass should be. And everybody's, ah, Jesus, fuck, his head is where his ass should be. By the time we filmed it, it was, oh, he's got a twig sticking out of his ear. I'll just cut that <laughs> I thought that was indicative of one of the problems. Is they didn't trust the idea that this is the first ship and we are like, what the fuck? I mean, my view is I always liked Enterprise to some degree, but it seemed to be a production team that was tired and had maybe run out of innovative ideas. And then your Manny Cotos and so on should have came on way earlier. I think that's probably fair. And not having been a fan of the previous iterations, I didn't have anything to compare it to. But my sense from the fans and my sense to a certain extent from even people around the set was, that, yes, this is a family that's been together a very long time. They know what they're doing. They're very good at what they're doing. But it does feel like it's coming out of the same cookie cutter that the previous show came out of. Yeah. There was even episodes that just felt like episodes that were on other shows and things. The one you had, Dear Doctor, for example, is, is day as day in a lot of ways, a, a TNG episode, just sort of reskinned a little bit. I have no doubt. I went in once thinking that I'll do what Bob Carter does. I'll go in and pitch. And they had a blackboard. They had their, what they called cheesy crusties. And it was all the ideas that they've done a thousand times and have been pitched a thousand times. And I came in and was like, uh, oh, 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 I, never mind. 
<laughs> and it made me realize how hard it is in that franchise to come up with new ideas. I mean, it's been on since 1966. You mentioned some of the scenes that you shared with other actors. Who were some of your favorite scene partners that you, that you like to work with? Oh, gosh, I hope I can remember her name because I'm going to be really embarrassed if I can't. The woman who played my wife, Fleasel, Weasel, Weasel, Diesel, whatever. <laughs> I love her. I love her. She played my wife's daughter. My real wife's daughter. My wife was not too happy when it turned out that her daughter was played my wife. <laughs> I said, the Nobulas, we got it. We're hottie magnets. I love getting to work with her. I love getting to work with Kelly Waymeyer. Some of the more mucky muck guest stars we had, I didn't necessarily have a ton of interaction with. There were any number of episodes when I had one or two scenes. They'd come in and I'd tell somebody they had an endocrine problem and then I'd wave my magic wand and I'd fix it up and then they'd leave. So I didn't get a chance to work with, I think Fianula Flanagan was on, and I can't remember some of them. But of the ones that I got substantial time with, there was one episode where his last name was Stram. Henry Stram, I think. He was a representative from a species that my species had long been at war with, and we had very little affection between us. And he had a fatal disease. I could cure it, but I wasn't going to do it if he didn't ask me, and he wasn't going to ask me because he didn't want to work with me. And I was like, oh, that's fine. I liked him. He was a nice guy. I really liked working with him a lot. There wasn't anybody that I can think of where it was like, you know, Jesus Christ. It was uniformly, I thought, pretty good cast, and I didn't have any issues with anybody. I would have liked to see more flocks and Hoshi scenes because any of those were always great, but there wasn't enough of them. I think a problem was they didn't do very much with Hoshi in general. Yeah, I think they wrote themselves into a little bit of a corner by suggesting that Hoshi... This happened to me on a series years ago. When they kind of write the character as being timid or trepidatious, it's hard because the writers don't necessarily gravitate to telling stories about a timid or trepidatious character because you're basically telling the same story over and over again. Timid, trepidatious character learns to face her fears. Timid, trepidatious character learns to face her fears. You have to be excited as a writer about the character to feel like you're going to lean into writing for them. And I don't think they gave Hoshi enough to work with the way they, they wrote her. Dominic, I think, suffered a little bit from the same thing. And Anthony, while they may not have used me as much as I might have liked, because I like to work, a lot of that is because I'm not an action adventure guy. I mean, they're not going to have me throwing punches or running around in my underwear. But I do think that what they wrote the doctor to be was intriguing and dimensional enough for the writers to kind of want to figure out like hey, we should do some more with the it was harder to do that with dom and hoshi and anthony not because they're not good actors but just because they weren't really fought through as dimensionalized characters from the jump yeah they were in every episode but they didn't really have much to do they were just sitting at their bridge stations and they made a decision early on and i don't know whether it was the right one or the wrong one i honestly can't say i might not have made a difference one way or the other to try and replicate in a certain way the triangular relationship that existed between kirk mccoy and spock and connor the captain and jolene and instead of having more of an ensemble feel it became a little bit more like the original series in that respect the rest of us we weren't exactly supernumeraries the way i think people were as much in the original series but we didn't have the same level of attention paid to us i don't write the episode i've never been it's like hey you know what you've hired me you're giving me a nice check i've got a nice life i'm happy to come to work i'm happy to go home from work i'm not here to rock your boat i think some of my fellow castmates might have felt a, a little bit of a sense of grievance, can understand. Yeah, well, I really liked Flocks and Hoshi's friendship as well. That was one of the little persistent things they kept coming back to, and it was there from the beginning to the end, really. Yeah, there again, though, I don't think they quite knew where to go with it. I mean, it wasn't going to develop into a romance. And to a certain extent, if they want Hoshi to come into her own... She can't necessarily just be kind of coming to Dr. Flox as she was in an early episode saying, teach me, help me. I appreciated there was a time when I was teaching her Denobulin, and I thought that was kind of fun. It was always a pleasure to work with her. I love Linda. I love her as a person. I love her as an actress. So I would have wished for more of that too. But I can, again, understand why they couldn't quite figure out where to go with it either. Yeah, it was just a lot of ancillary scenes where you would just be having a chat in the midst of everything, and then that'd be it. Yeah, I look back and I think and count on the fingers of maybe one hand or two hands, maybe. The episodes where I felt like there was, ooh, this is a fun, interesting ride that the Doctor gets to go on in this episode. There weren't a ton of those. I liked the spirit of the character. I liked who the guy was. And there was never a scene that was consequently not fun to play. I mean, some of the ones where it was truly just, oh, blah, 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 and the endocrine system can be fixed. But as you know, the endocrine system is also problematic because yada, yada, yada. Just the storytelling beat that's required. But mostly in the scene, there was something to play with that was fun. But in terms of deep dive, there wasn't a ton of that. Another reason why for 
years was enough. How was it learning all that jargon with Star Trek? It's famous for all the technical and you had technical and made up medical jargon as well. Yeah, the medical jargon wasn't as hard. What's really the hard thing for me are the species names, especially if they change the species name at the last minute, which they occasionally would do for reasons I can't who knows. It's not like there's an actual species said, you can't use my name. I'm sorry. <laughs> but there were a couple of times when you'd get the changes in the morning or the night before. And it's on the day, if you're going along fine until you get to the, what is it? The Gaborians. All right. It was the Gaborians yesterday. <laughs> Those moments would be irritating. Generally speaking, what's hard about television is that particularly if you're number one, is you don't have enough time to drop the lines really deep. I mean, in an ideal world, you want the lines to be so deep that the last thing in the world you're thinking about is the word. You're simply in the moment, present, working off your partner deeply in the scene. Television, because it moves so fast and you've got new words every day, there's a lot of times, you can sometimes see this, where the actor has barely clinging to his lines, where it's like they have a tenuous purchase. And some part of your brain is thinking about what you're saying next instead of just letting go and be seen. That's the challenge of television, the way television used to be made, 26 or 32 episodes. Again, and again, 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 again. Less of a strain, less of a demand now a little bit because we make fewer episodes. Would you go back to Flocks if you're asked Star Trek's big again? So it's not impossible. I'd go back. I'd go back. On the picket line, we were having some conversations, some strange new world writers and I. Well, who's to say he doesn't live another hundred years? Why not? Exactly. And if he's dead, he's got a son. <laughs> a grandson. Who knows? Yeah, no, I would go back. I think if I was asked to go back to the world of Star Trek as it existed 20 years ago, where it's 22, 26 episodes a season, I don't know if I want to do that. But to be on a cable or a streaming show where it's 13 episodes, and I wouldn't be in more than a handful, or I'd only be a guest star, absolutely. I'm sure they could come up with a way to throw flocks in Strange New Worlds for an episode or two. Why not? Or a Lower Decks. That's where I do the voiceover. I'd happily... <laughs> Do the cartoon Dr. Flux. I think, in fact, that's where we've seen Denobulans. I think we saw Denobulans on Lower Decks. They've shown up in Discovery as well. Oh, they have shown up. Okay. One of the ideas I did kind of pitch really informally, like at the craft service table, if I bumped into Rick or Brandon. How about this? You pick up a ship in distress. It's all Denobulans, and they come on board, and they're all like Oscar Madison. They're horrible slobs. They leave their <laughs> underpants lying around. They like a half-eaten Brussels sprout. They stink up the bathroom. It's like, get these Denobulans off the ship. But they all look like me. <laughs> I pitched that. Because I was thinking the day will come, if the show keeps going, the iterations of the show, they'll have to come to me. Because all Denobulans look like me. They said, no, we're not going to do that. That's a shame. Maybe season six, if they got there, that idea would have... I take credit for the uh, one where he's hibernating. I don't think they think that came from me. I think they came up with that independently, but I'd been talking about maybe he hibernates. What if they have to wake him up for hibernation? So then they did that. They couldn't credit you with the idea, otherwise they'd have to pay you for it, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. I realized I should keep my ideas to myself. I'm just going to get pissed off. The other idea I had is I lost some weight in the third season. I found that weight again. But I thought, you know, maybe they could have an episode where it turns out that Dr. Flux has a tapeworm and they pull it out of his ass and they throw it out the airlock and it wraps itself around the ship and we're trapped <laughs> boxes tape for it. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Even. Although the worm was referenced, at least. That's true. The worm was referenced. And the episode where I'm naked, I do feel like I, I was responsible for that because I was making fun with Chris Black, the writer, at a party saying, you know, everybody running around in their blue undie pants. When am I going to be in my blue undie pants? <laughs> and Chris Black said, well, maybe Denobians don't wear undie pants at all. And I said, well, bring it on, baby. And then it's <laughs> three, there I am. There I am. You had that big set all to yourself? I wanted to do a Benny Hill moment where I walk in and I turn sharply to the left and all the way across the room, a flower pot falls to the ground. <laughs> they said no to that. Just being blocked by various medical equipment as you're walking yep. past. They did, yeah. they did that part, but they didn't do the uh, long cock blocks. Is what <laughs> did that he actually, I call myself Phil Flocks. <laughs> I don't know. I want that in the canon somehow. I realize it's <laughs> Lower decks, I guess that's where you got it. I like to think of him as a doctor and a used car salesman. Go fly. <laughs> you have life insurance? How about term and policy? Well, I mean, it sounds like you had a great time on Enterprise and you relished the fact that you weren't in it all the time as well. The idea that you just had some time to take it in, I suppose. Oh, yeah. No, it was great. The contract is every episode produced. If you're a series regular, some contracts will be like six out of 13. They'll definitely commit to you being in six. They're not going to pay you for the ones you're not in. But 
most network television back in the day, you're a series regular, you're paid for every episode, even if you're not in it. So yeah, I think there are two I wasn't in. You get that script, you go, buddy, we got two weeks off, where do you want to go? <laughs> On the company tab. I tried to find other work. It's not like it's that easy. You can't just snap your fingers. I bet the contract people were regretting that when they saw how little some of the other actors would end up being in it. Well, as I said, I did like to torment Dom with my song. And a lot of it was just because back in the day, you know, they always brought McCoy on the bridge. I always thought, what's he doing on the fucking bridge? He has no business on the bridge. Shouldn't he be down working with sick people? They never brought me on the bridge. I think I was on the bridge once or twice. And I was so relieved because the bridge, it's interminable. We're all spread out. So there are no two shots. It's not like you can kind of cluster everybody together. We can just knock this out with a master. And a little close up. We don't have to spend all day on this. They got to go here and they got to go there and they got to go here and they got to go there. And then they got to look at the screen. And it's a different setup for every one of those shots. And frequently on the bridge, that's when you're shaking and it's when you're having to pretend to look scared because you're looking at a fearsome creature when all you're really looking at is the second AD with a sign saying fearsome creature. (laughs) Those are long ass, boring motherfucking days. I was very happy I was not on the bridge. Well, the reason that this conversation was put together is my friend Ashley, who's doing some work for you on the Hollywood Food Coalition, and you're getting the word out there. So now's your time. Talk about it. Tell tell the listeners and me everything about it. First of all, I'll talk about the event that is designed to raise money for the Hollywood Food Coalition, and then I'll talk about the Hollywood Food Coalition. Trek Talks is taking place on January 13th, and it is like going to a convention, except you don't have to wear pants. It's eight hours, starting at 10 in the morning, Pacific Time, American Pacific Time, to 6 o'clock p.m., American Pacific Time. It's a ton of panels, conversations, guests from all walks of Star Trek. Great actors. Last year, we had Anson Mount, Scott Bakula. We've had Jerry Ryan. We're going to have Frakes this year. I'll get my list up because I can never remember everybody. Who we have this year? Roddenberry's coming. Tawny Newsom is coming. The crossover episode. We're going to have a special episode devoted to the crossover episode with the guys who wrote it. Naomi Melamod, the composer, is coming. The Hagemans are coming. Connor and Dominic, Terry Metalis, Gates, Brent, Jonathan Del Arco, Michelle Hurd, on and on. Tim Russ, Ethan Phillips, Ty Phoenix, who does one Wonderful work helping to organize people to get out the vote, trek the vote. Everybody that you can think of that has anything to do with the track community, we want to get involved in this. This is going to be our third year. It's a ton of fun. We raise money for an organization called the Hollywood Food Coalition, which I've been involved with for about seven years. It's based in Los Angeles. We do a lot of things. We provide a hot multi-course meal to all comers seven nights a week. We help hook them up with other social service organizations to help support some of their other needs housing programs, drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs. We have a medical van, a dental van, a vision van that comes to our campus. We also rescue 3 million pounds of food a year, and we share it with about 150 other organizations to help augment and buttress their meal programs. And finally, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we work with a lot of other community groups to try and figure out solutions that can only be arrived at collectively. How do you get more refrigeration capacity into the community? How do you identify more places where you can pick up food, more places that need food? How do you get more volunteers activated, more storage space, more mulching capacity? A lot of the work of rescuing and sharing food has to involve a shitload of people. So the coalition building aspect, which is something that I'm really proud of that our group does, is a lot of what animates me and is a lot of what I think makes this an organization worthy of supporting, even if you don't live in Los Los Angeles, because we represent ways of thinking about these problems that communicate to other areas that can be looked at and studied and copied in other areas. That's my really good, quick elevator pitch. It's your pitch. Yeah. So the event, is that streamable online? Is that how you watch it? Yes, that's exactly how you watch it. It's streamable. It's on January 13th, and you can go to trektalks.net. We are also sponsored by Roddenberry Podcast, Trek Movie, and Trek Geeks. And you can also visit our own website, which is the Hollywood Food Coalition, or hofoco.org. Any of those aforementioned places will be able to link directly to the show and because i am not the techie in our game our wonderful and brilliant marketing team has figured out ways to magically do that that i'm frankly at a loss to understand but there are all sorts of ways that you can watch the show those sites 
trektalks.net. You push the button and there you are. I'll make sure that all the relevant links are in the show notes so that people can follow them and learn more about it and things. And it sounds like an absolutely great cause, but I don't know how it is in the US, but in the UK, we have a pretty horrendous cost of living crisis. It's been coined where people literally can't afford to have the meals they need in a day. So things like this have never been more important in terms of making sure that people get the nutrition they need. Yeah. And for us, the idea is that if you have a wonderful hot meal provided every day, and we always say that the dignity of choice is important so that people come to us, would you like a vegetarian, a vegan, or a carnivorian option? Would you like a side of pasta or potato? Would you like bread? Would you like a green salad, a fruit salad, a dessert? You've got multiple options. What kind of beverage? We want people to feel like they're getting as close as, as you can feel to a, what you get in a restaurant. A lot of people who are experiencing dire poverty or who are living on the streets don't get much choice in their life. And there's something that we feel about the dignity that is afforded to people when you say, please tell us what you'd like, that can be uplifting for people who may only eat one time a day. The fact that we do it every day, we've never missed a day in 37 years, 38 years, is also what allows people to know that they can count on something. And the consistency and regularity is the other thing that is in lives where so much is, sadly, if you're living on the streets, you can turn around and and somebody just whisked all of your belongings up. People have a hard time holding on to the paperwork they need, their identity papers, to be able to apply for a job or housing program, yada, yada. The stability of the program is really important to us. And because of that, because people know they can come here every night, that's how we can hook them up with other partners. Because this is the place they know they will return to. And we can say, great, you don't have to, but while you're here, can we introduce you to? Because this guy can help you get new identification papers. This guy can help you with all these parking tickets that your camper got that you can't pay and that you're scared about. This guy can help you if you're looking for temporary housing, a place that will also take your dog so you won't have to be parted from your animal. This guy will help you if you want and need to find a home for your animal because you can no longer provide for them. That's what we try and do is create a place that sort of is a one-stop shopping center for people. We are looking to expand our campus in the next couple of years so we can do that more effectively. It does sound great. And the fact that, it, like you say, the dignity of choice, that seems to be something that a lot of people are lacking these days as well. Like I was talking about with the cost of living situation over here where people, they take what they can get and it's so dehumanizing, isn't it? And it's sort of heartbreaking that the people in government aren't doing enough to put these things to bed. Yeah. I would like nothing more. As I was saying to somebody else this morning, I was doing an interview and, and I'd like nothing more than to not have to do this. I'd like to live in a society that took care of people to such an extent that private charity was not needed. The idea that people rely on people like me is ridiculous. And it is a shameful abandonment of what it means to be a civilization. We have definitely seen an erosion, I think, in, in some of what I would have taken to be the compact, the social compact, that we all agree that we're in this together and that so consequently, the least of us will not be left behind. The return to a form of social Darwinism that you see happening in so many places around the world is really just tremendously troubling. I, I lived in England for a while and it's very painful to see what's happening there. Yeah, so great stuff. And the event itself will be, like you say, an online convention. So there'll be panels and things throughout the day that people can tune in and see and interviews and all that stuff. Yeah. We put out in advance, sort of like, here are our guests. We try and kind of give people a sense of every two hours, here are some of the things you're going to see. You know, in the middle of the day, there's going to be one hour-long Picard Season 3 panel with a lot of wonderful guests. But we don't give everybody everything because we want there also to be the element of surprise so that people are not inclined to watch. Because if you go to the bathroom, oh, what did I miss? <laughs> so... Don't wear pants, bring a paper cup to tea in, park yourself. It's also the part of you that may wish that you go to a convention, have people over to your house, watch it together. And the other thing I always want to say is that obviously we're all going through tough times. And if people can't contribute, come anyway. What I'd ask maybe is if you don't have the ability to put anything forward yourself, could you do some lifting on social media for us? Could you share it? If you could spread the word and let your friends know about it and put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That even if you are coming and you're not going to be able to contribute yourself, you can feel like you did your bit. That's kind of what I ask. It's kind of a buy-in for folks. Yeah, cool. Well, I'll make sure all the relevant links are in the show notes and on the day itself. I'll be sure to tune in at least while I'm awake because it will be your time, which is later my time. Your, your time. Yeah, yeah. You might not off towards the end of it, which I totally am. <laughs> You're trying to find that sweet spot of when can we do it and still capture the bulk 
of an audience somewhere. Yeah. And is it something that when the event's over, you can just watch it back? Absolutely. In fact, the first two years lives on YouTube, Trek Talks 1, Trek Talks 2. And we do say that to people as if you missed it, go watch it. It lives forever. But remember, just because you've watched it a month later, it's still a telethon for you. So make a comment. <laughs> Great stuff. The last question I always ask people on this podcast, since we do a lot of nerdy stuff, is if you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? If I could have a superpower, wow. Well, of course, I, I should pick a superpower where I can use my power for the betterment of man. So fast reading guy would probably, <laughs> that would just be selfish. That's the first thing that comes to mind. I don't want to ask for the moon and the stars. What would be the superpower where I could actually use my powers for the b super debating man? Super debating man would go everywhere and he would be immediately able to recall all the facts, figures and information he needed to super debate your ass right into the ground. That's a good one. Not had that one before. That'd be cool. You could have that and speed reading because that would be able to learn everything. They would support each other. Yeah. Yeah. I would be consequently the superhero that nobody wants around. It's like, oh, fuck. Here comes super debating man. <laughs> Jesus. So all the other superheroes would beat the shit out of me. What am I thinking? I see this is, I'm not good. I picked the wrong one. <laughs> I picked the one that's most likely to get me punched. At least you would be able to tell them the true facts as you were being punched. While they're punching me, I would show them the error of their ways. <laughs> what you don't understand is that violence is frequently a product of... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one. Not had that one before. So well done. You've been unique. You didn't pick flying, which most people do. Flying has no appeal to me whatsoever. I see the value of getting from one point to the other, but I mean, unless you're carrying your suitcases while you fly you gotta get a whole fucking new wardrobe when you get there and and i'm afraid of heights and the vision thing i was always afraid i'd turn the heat vision on when i meant to turn the x-ray vision on and vice versa <laughs> and i burn something to shit sorry mom i didn't mean to be i was trying to like turn the burner on oh jesus <laughs> invisibility i bet you get that sometimes yeah we do all that means is that person's a pervert <laughs> hey i want to be invisibility guy he might as well just say pervert <laughs> For me, it's a super speed because I still want to see stuff, but I want to get places quickly as well. I can see that. I can see super speed. Wouldn't your pants burn off though? I'd have to get friction proof clothes. See, that's what would stop me. Where do I get friction proof clothes? Is there a <laughs> friction proof clothing store? I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. Or maybe my power would prevent that from happening. I don't know. I'm beginning to feel better about my choice, actually. Now that <laughs> I've gone through the other options, I'm thinking, you know, I chose well, actually. Practical. Definitely practical. Ah, super debating man wins again. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time. It means the world to me to get to gab a bit about the charity I support. And thanks for being part of it. Not at all. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for agreeing to come on. It, it was great to speak to you and let you get the word out a bit through this podcast. And I've been watching Star Trek my entire life. So I always love it when I get to speak to actors who were in Star Trek, as well as other shows that I enjoy. It's a pleasure for me. That's part of why I do this. I end this because I also am a member of the Pancreatic Cancer Action I mentioned earlier. If you ever want to, my colleagues, Jonathan Frakes, Armin Shimmerman, Kitty Swink, and Juan Carlos Soto, especially as we get closer to our big walk in the spring, if you wanted us to come on, we'd happily talk about that. And you could ask us questions about our disreputable. I would shut up because I've already talked, but you could ask Jonathan Frakes questions about his disreputable career. I would absolutely set you up on that. If you slipped my name in their pockets, I would be most grateful. I shall indeed. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. I won't take up any more of your time. You've been gracious enough to give me quite a lot of it. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. That was my conversation with John Billingsley. Please follow the links in the show notes to the Hollywood Food Coalition, where you can donate if you're able to, and tune in to the upcoming Trek Talks event. If you're listening after 13th of January, then you can find the event on YouTube. If you want to talk about anything discussed here, or anything else really, you can hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. You can also join us on Discord. For more interviews, a monthly news podcast, and deep dive analytical discussions about your favourite nerdy things, join us on Neil Before Pod.